Hello again, friends. This will be another case study, and we're going to see a patient today with headache and joint pain. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link below in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right-hand corner. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. I appreciate your consideration in advance. Thank you very much. So we have a 67-year-old white woman coming into the office complaining of an ongoing dull headache for the past three days. She rates it as a 7 out of 10. She describes the pain as right-sided but poorly localized, pointing laterally to her right eye. She's tried taking risotriptan, also known as Maxalt, that's prescribed for her occasional migraines, but it has not helped. She also describes some scalp pain, which she has never had before, and it makes it uncomfortable to comb her hair or lay on a pillow. She also endorses a recent history of fatigue and mild generalized joint pain that is worse than usual, especially in the morning. She denies changes to her sleep routine, denies changes to sleep habits, eight hours per night. She has a history of type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, and migraine. Her medications include metformin, ibuprofen, risotriptan. She works occasionally as a substitute teacher, no alcohol, tobacco, or drug use. Vitals are within normal limits. So what stands out in this patient? Well, her headache, for one. So she's got a headache. I'm going to use black here. So she's got a headache. Um, it's been going on for a few days. Uh, anytime you've got a patient with a headache, you want to know where it is, what's the nature, what helps it, what makes it worse. So it's right-sided, so we know this is a unilateral headache. Poorly localized, but lateral to right eye, so maybe temporal or retroorbital. And what has she tried doing to help it? Well, she's tried taking risotriptan. That's used for migraines, and it hasn't helped. So maybe this is not her typical migraine headache pain. We also know that she's got some scalp pain. That's important to know, as we're going to see. So, um, you know, you've got a, a few other symptoms here that kind of coincide with the headache. And then we also know that she's got some generalized joint pain. Um, that's worse than usual and some fatigue. But interestingly about this joint pain, it's worse in the morning. Now, she does have a diagnosis of osteoarthritis, which would be a very common cause of joint pain, especially in older adults. But typically, osteoarthritis worsens with use. If you've got a patient with m early morning joint pain, that tends to point to a rheumatologic cause, things like rheum rheumatoid arthritis, connective tissue disorders, um, and so on and so forth. So that's something that we want to keep an eye on and possibly uh, consider alternative diagnoses to the osteoarthritis. All right, so you've got a patient in the office, you're taking CCS, what do you want to do for your physical exam? You're going to do a lot because you've got a patient in the office, you don't need to be as, um, what's the word, um, focused. Uh, so you can do multiple systems. You're not dealing with an emergency here. Um, and so it's good to have all of those, uh, all of that data. So we'll, uh, we'll do pretty much the whole thing. You're going to leave out things you really don't need to do. So you're not going to need to do a rectal exam in this patient. You're certainly not going to need to do a vaginal exam in this patient. So, you know, you can not click those things, but pretty much everything else you can go ahead and do. Um, so what do we see? We see that the Scalp tenderness is uh, is uh, replicated on palpation. Um, we see that she's got full range of motion. There's no joint deformity or warmth. These extremity and joint exams are going to be really important when you've got a patient with, with joint pain. And so we don't see any deformity or warmth, and she's got full range of motion. Okay, so um, what do we do? Well, we got to formulate our differential. So we got a patient with a headache. You should be able to list off five very common causes of headache. Uh, tension headache, probably the most common cause of headache. Migraine, well, this is a patient with migraine, so that's certainly something we need to consider. Cluster headache, temporal arteritis, pseudotumor cerebri. Uh, another thing that you would want to probably have on your differential for headache, although it's highly unlikely in this patient is subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you should know your common causes of headaches uh, and, and be able to uh, you know list those. And I've got a table in a little bit that I'm gonna show you that'll help. Um, now, as far as the joint pain, uh, that could be osteoarthritis. She has a diagnosis of that. Because it's early in the morning, it could be something rheumatological. So rheumatoid arthritis, 
Polymyalgia rheumatica, very common in older adults, particularly over the age of 50. So knowing this, our initial workup is going to be focused on trying to find signs of inflammation because we've got a patient with joint pain and we need to figure out the cause. Now the headache, headaches are typically diagnosed clinically. So you probably already have a really good idea of what is going on here if you know your common causes of headaches and you know how they present. And this patient had a very particular presentation, noting that this is an older patient. This is a patient with a headache and this is a patient with scalp pain. Okay, and that headache is temporal. This suggests temporal arteritis, also known as giant cell arteritis. That's our presumptive cause. So what we need to do then is we need to confirm that. Now, you could say that maybe this is possibly a migraine that's not responding to the tryptan, although migraines tend to be much shorter lived and go away on their own. This is much more ongoing. Um, and so even if we don't think this is temporal arteritis, we still want to check the inflammatory markers. So we're going to get a CBC and then inflammatory markers include ESR and CRP. You might just get ESR, but throw in both. Uh, we're also going to get rheumatoid factor. This is very unlikely to be, uh, to be rheumatoid arthritis. It typically presents much earlier on, but we're going to include that just because this is early morning joint pain. And then you may or may not get a chest x-ray. If you understand temporal arteritis, you'll know why we get a chest x-ray, but we're, we're, uh, this is uh, not necessarily the most important thing in this patient. Um, but as we're, we'll, we'll see why we do that in a little bit. So we get our uh, tests back. The CBC was within normal limits. The inflammatory markers were both elevated. You will be given the uh, normal values on your exam. Rheumatoid factor is negative and the chest x-ray was unremarkable. So we've got a patient uh, now who's got temporal headache. Uh, she's got scalp tenderness. She's older and she's got elevated inflammatory markers. Our diagnosis is temporal arteritis. Now, you have probably heard before that temporal biopsy needs to be done in order to make a diagnosis of temporal arteritis, and that is actually not true. Now, getting a temporal artery biopsy is not easy. It's bloody, it's gross, it hurts, and so if we can avoid it, we try to avoid it. Another problem with temporal artery biopsy is that because of the patchy-like pattern of inflammation of the temporal artery, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a, a very sensitive. Uh, and in any case, even if you got a negative temporal artery biopsy, we're still going to treat the patient in patients who have a lot of clinical signs. So this is not necessary to do, um, but it is something if you can't necessarily make the diagnosis clinically, and there are criteria which we'll go on to in a little bit. The immediate management of presumed temporal arteritis is prednisone. Now, if the patient has much more serious symptoms, let's say they've got visual field deficits, then we are going to give IV corticosteroids, and that would be solumedrol or methylprednisolone, which is just prednisone given IV. Now, you give a patient prednisone, you need to advise the patient of the side effects, and you need to tell them how important it is to comply, uh, because even though the symptoms may go away, they need to continue the full dose, the full regimen of the steroids. Now, you should treat the patient as soon as the diagnosis of temporal arteritis is suspected because the number one complication of temporal arteritis is blindness in the, in, in the ipsilateral eye. So if you do get a biopsy, even if you haven't formally made the diagnosis based on clinical criteria, you should still give steroids. Steroids aren't going to hurt them, um, but it could very much help them. So headache in the adult patient, I'm not going to run through all of these, uh, but these are seven very common causes, or at least um, fairly common causes of headache in the adult patient. Uh, tension headache is the number one cause. Migraine, the big thing with migraine is that it's throbbing and retroorbital, um, and they may or may not have a, a, an aura. 
Uh, it can go on days, but it tends to be hours. Uh, cluster headache is the stabbing, retroorbital, always unilateral pain, and most importantly, they have conjunctival injection and tearing. Uh, this is extremely severe, but it only lasts minutes. Uh, temporal arteritis is what we're dealing with here. Pseudotum pseudotumor cerebri tends to worsen with Valsalva. It's in the morning, tends to be in young obese women. Intracranial mass, look for focal neurologic signs. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is a thunderclap headache. It's due to aneurysmal bleeding. And it's very similar in pattern to meningitis, but there's no fever. Uh, so think of temporal arteritis when you've got a new headache in an older person. And especially that scalp tenderness, that's very important. So this is just an illustration of four common causes of headaches. This doesn't include temporal arteritis, but these are four common causes of headaches in adults. And this is another illustration. Okay, so this is the diagnostic criteria for temporal arteritis. You need to have three or more of these criteria in order to make a clinical diagnosis. If you're able to make a clinical diagnosis, then you do not need to do a temporal artery biopsy. But let's say they only have two of these and you're susp it, you think it may be temporal arteritis, but they don't fit all the fill, fulfill all the criteria, then at that point you may uh, do a temporal artery biopsy. But if you really think it is temporal arteritis to the point where you're going to get a biopsy, start the steroids, okay? Very important. So age over 50, that was this patient. New onset headache, that was this patient. Temporal artery abnormality, meaning it hurts when you press it or maybe you don't appreciate a really good pulse, uh, that was this patient. Sed rate, over 50, that's why we get the sed rate. It's one of the criteria, that was this patient. And then a temporal artery biopsy that's abnormal. Again, remembering that not it's not 100% sensitive. So you may get, because it's patchy and you only, I mean, you don't take the whole temporal artery out, right? Um, so, uh, you, but you need to take at least one centimeter if you're taking the temporal artery biopsy. Now, this is polymyalgia rheumatica. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but this, these are the diagnostic criteria for polymyalgia rheumatica. You can come back to this if you want. Okay, so the diagnosis here is temporal arteritis. This is a large artery inflammation that's typically seen in older patients over the age of 50. I apologize in advance if you are over the age of 50. I don't mean to call you old. I have been yelled at by, by viewers in some of my comments for calling people over 50 old. Um, my mother is 56, so she would probably not be too happy if she heard this video. The most feared complication is permanent vision loss as well as an increased risk for aortic aneurysm. It usually coexists, often coexists, with polymyalgia rheumatica just because the patient demographics are similar. But if you look down here, about 15 to 20 percent of patients with PMR have temporal arteritis, and about 40 to 60 percent of patients with temporal arteritis also have PMR. That was this patient. So what is polymyalgia rheumatica? You'll classically hear these patients described uh, describe it's difficult to raise their arms. It's difficult to get up from a seated position because this tends to affect the shoulders and the hip girdles. Um, so they'll get some weakness and pain. Now, this sounds a lot like polymyositis, right? But the difference is polymyositis tends to be in younger people and polymyositis will have an elevated CPK. Now, you can get a CPK if you want and that will help you differentiate between the two. Now, they may demonstrate constitutional signs at presentation, things like a low-grade fever, anorexia, weight loss, so look out for that. The SED rate and CP CRP will always be elevated. Um, that's almost a sine qua known for PMR and temporal arteritis. Fortunately, polymyalgia rheumatica quickly responds to corticosteroids, so the treatment for polymyalgia rheumatica and temporal arteritis are the same. Now, we will follow these patients up in one to three weeks uh, because eventually we're going to need to taper the steroids. So our management, of course, is prednisone. We already talked about that, and we're going to continue that until the SED rate returns to normal. In severe cases, we will admit these patients and give them IV corticosteroids. Now, because we're putting these patients on steroids, it is useful to give them calcium and vitamin D. You may give bisphosphonates if they are on long-term corticosteroids. Uh, 
Uh, make sure and advise, especially older patients on corticosteroids, to do an exercise program because they are at risk for developing steroid secondary oste uh, uh, osteoporosis. Uh, you'll refer these patients to ophthalmology for a formal ophthalmologic exam and refer the patient to rheumatology because they can uh, better manage the patient's uh, steroid regimen and follow-up. Manage these patients as outpatients unless there are severe symptoms or if the patient's unable to care for themselves. And if they do ask you on CCS or on uh, just your ordinary step three questions, you follow these patients up in one to three weeks. So just to recap, the presenting signs of temporal arteritis are unilateral headache and scalp tenderness. There's a tendency to coincide with PMR, which usually presents as proximal joint pain, especially in the morning. Laboratory findings are generally normal, except for the elevated sub rate and CRP. The diagnosis is based on the aforementioned ACR criteria. They need to have three or more of the five. Due to increased risk of aortic aneurysm, you may order a, a chest x-ray or a chest CT. That is optional, but if you have a patient that's got a history of temporal arteritis, you always want to make sure that they're aware uh, of their increased risk for this. And the treatment is corticosteroids, which you will give as soon as the diagnosis is presumptive. You do not need to wait for a formal diagnosis just because uh, the risk of, of, of blindness is so high and we want to avoid that. And you'll continue the corticosteroids until the sed rate normalizes.